Quick note before we get started, there is some cursing in today's episode, so if you're listening with young children around or impressionable ears, maybe put some headphones on or wait till later. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guest is Becca Powers, a restaurateur and hospitality maven who has shunned the high volume approach to the restaurant biz in favor of giving her guests a tailored and memorable experience. Becca worked in numerous bars and rock clubs across Boston before opening up Tanuki, a restaurant inspired by her love of Japanese food and culture, and which is named after the mystical, shape-shifting creature that also happens to be very well endowed. Listen in as we cover Becca's memorable Kickstarter campaign to open Tanuki, why finding the right investors for a project is crucial to the success of that project, and how she earned the nickname Becca the Recca. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. We're here with Becca the Recca, a good friend of ours from Boston uh, who launched Tanuki in Provincetown. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. So I met Becca, I was probably 24 years old. You were the maitre d' at Drink. Drink is probably still my favorite cocktail bar in all of the, I think the world probably. What were your days at Drink like? They were really fun. It was the most fun job that I ever had. You guys were doing something brand new. At the time. At the time, right? Completely different concept. It was was this little bar in Cambridge um, that I think was still open then called Blue Sky Fun but it was sort of the spot where all of the important Boston bartenders in LA were mm. associated with to work on that bar. And it was the mm. kind of place back when we could smoke cigarettes where you'd be thinking about smoking a cigarette and uh, have them smoke cigarettes. And you'd go to like, just start to think about pulling a pack of smokes out of your pocket, and the bartenders would lean over the bar and then have like their zippos out, just burning, waiting for you to pull. Oh, wow. Wow. Pat, and so obviously when people were smoking cigarettes anymore, which is a good thing, but mm-hmm. that attitude and that mindset of anticipating people's needs and surprising them really was inspiring to me and I think a lot of the other folks that were mm-hmm. in the industry at the time. And so out of that bar came just the standard and drink and then all of the other ones that were really kind of the, the first craft cocktail bars that were playing around with interesting spirits and fresh juices and it at the time you know, 15 years ago it seemed like such a novel thing and now you can't go too deep and <laughs> craft something or sustainable something or fresh whatever or homemade tinctures or mm-hmm. a drug or you know, a lot of that kind of came out of that scene yeah definitely what the crazy part was too is like everybody who was working there including yourself They've all gone on to either start their own bars, restaurants, that all over the country. Really, yeah, lead really, bar really, programs yeah. all over. It's wild. It's all amazing. World. I think about that a lot. I talk to my husband about it a lot. And I saw John Gritson, the guy who started yeah. the bar. Yeah. Um, on San Francisco now, right? San Francisco a few days ago. And mm-hmm. you guys are even at that. Oh, that's great. Other than like big parties where a thousand people that you know and you want to hang out with are there, it's really overwhelming me like, to see the photos since I left. Mm. That company is so expensive. We can act in, um, I think that the two of us are sort of over certain parts of our lives <laughs> where like, we were always, you know, we're always in the spotlight. Or, and so it was fun to see them just bartending and relaxing and not being in charge of 50 different things. And what were some of the cool. biggest things you learned at Drink? Like just being there with something so new, right? Such a new concept that... You guys are pioneers. <laughs> in some way, yeah. I've always been a pretty nice person, but previously, uh, with the exception of this one standard, I worked at almost all kind of rowdy rock clubs. I worked at the Middle East and Cameron. Oh, wow. So like legendary, yeah. legendary old rock club. Huge I rumor. worked at a church, which is now something different, Harper's Ferry, which is now Detroit Music Hall. And across the board, they were like the grimiest, shittiest <laughs> places that you could hang out, but see really great music. Yeah. And there was 
was no pressure back then to be nice to anybody who came into the space. It was like a total gatekeeper mentality <laughs> that I had, and I, I came up in the world as like a five foot bouncer. And <laughs> back of the racka. That's where that's where the name came from. Yeah. And uh, people couldn't believe that this tiny little woman could like, throw people out of the club. Could and, shut it down. Yeah, and so I got <laughs> this reputation for. Um, being kind of a badass, which is hell oh, yeah. Us, because I was always backed up by like 10 huge dudes. <laughs> and so I, I very rarely needed them. Really right. Because I have the natural ability and I think that a lot of women do to diffuse difficult situations, mm-hmm. especially in like a, in a security field. Um, there was so many years, you know, you had like a picture of the bar or just getting aggressive or just like dancing too aggressively or just not fitting in with whatever the scene of that night was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now, you could see it from a mile away if somebody was acting mm-hmm. weird. But like I said, there was no... Nobody told me I had to be nice to anybody. <laughs> and so I got that job as a bouncer because I started as cocktail waitress. I'm going to say that. <clears throat> when I just turned 21. And there was no security upstairs. It was only in the clubs. And so I just have to throw my own drunk car guests out. <laughs> and I got a reputation for that. And so the security team downstairs like, no job. <laughs> this is so Boston. <laughs> it is. I love it. Hey, hey, you want a job throwing people out for money? Yeah. yeah. You want that? All right. It's yours. It's fucking yours, guys. Keep throwing people out. You're yeah. doing good. You're doing good, kid. But simultaneously, I was a makeup artist for MAC Cosmetics. And so I was like... <laughs> totally <laughs> different world. Luxury stuff. Luxury goods. Luxury yeah. brands. Uh, I love champagne, mm-hmm. and I've always, since I was a little kid, I had an affinity for the shit. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah. I can relate. Yeah. Really... <laughs> and so I, I felt like as I sort of moved up in my career and went from you know, bouncer in a rowdy nightclub to a publicist in you know, almost as rowdy nightclub and then PR director and then all these sort of bigger roles that had less to do with security and more to do with selling an image of a business. And then I ended up at the Barbara Lynch Depot, which is now called the Barbara Lynch Collective, which sounds a little bit silly, but <laughs> it is what it is. But then I ended up at Drink and had this huge security background and a PR background and uh, they didn't really have a job description. They just knew that, oh, I remember, um, they, I went in for an interview for Mandarin Park. Mm. Okay. Real high end restaurants. Well, what were you going to do there? Oh, probably like a hostess. I think I wanted okay. to sort of start at the bottom in the higher end food world. Yeah. Yep. Because even though I had management and director level experience at all these like, big rowdy nightclubs, I didn't, I wasn't, it was not refined mm. at all. <laughs> um, I, I really needed my edges <clears throat> sort of sanded down. And somebody gave me a reference. Uh, and it was either Vinny Bessonette, the chef, the chef yeah. or Garrett Parker. Those were my two references. And Got somebody it. told the director of operations at the Barbara Lynch people at the time that I was rough around the edges, but worth it. <laughs> I like that. Did they know they were going to have a maitre d'? No. No, right? No, they didn't. They, they knew they had security issues. Okay. And But they didn't want to hire a bouncer because they didn't want to have that gatekeeper mentality. Yeah. Right. And so this and is sort of the... Yeah, it was like the first time that I felt like I could really bring both my experience but also my personality into a space and just sort of be myself. And I had the high volume background and understanding how to run the door and how to keep people safe and how to make sure that people weren't going to come into the space and and act really poorly. And so for the most part, we were able to really very carefully create our uh, language, I guess, in that we could communicate with guests when they were standing there in line and try to figure out, all right, is this person going to come in here wanting to have a good time, or mm-hmm. are they going to come in here wanting to make everybody's life, including their own, miserable? Mm-hmm. And so trying to figure out what people's motivations were before they even came into the bar, originally for a security purpose, right. and then ultimately, all right, so this person clearly had a bad day, and like, Maybe they're going to come into the space with a bad attitude. So instead of never letting them in, what can I do to just turn their attitude around? Mm. So like, 
not only are they not going to make my life difficult, but they're going to actually have a good time. Because like, oh my god, you know, I came in here with a bad attitude, and yeah. these people saw me for what I am, but they're still being nice to me, and they're still trying to bend over backwards to make me feel comfortable in this space, even though I'm kind of a jackass. Yeah. Right. Wow. And so being able. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Have the kind of autonomy as an HD to, to make those decisions about like, not from a gatekeeper perspective, mm-hmm. but a, I'm a hundred percent sure that if you come in a space, you're not going to have a good time. So right. There's this great bar across the street. If you're mm-hmm. not in the mood for waiting, because you know, if somebody waits for two hours and they come in and it's not, experience that they want to right. have, they're going to be additionally pissed off. And right. Lucky's is a good spot anyway. So yeah, can, especially if you want to like be in a bad mood. And, if like, you want to be in a bad mood, yeah. yeah. just get really drunk really fast. It's a great place. Lucky's is know. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't think anyone from Lucky's is going to be listening to this, so I think we're good. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> no, me either. So then, did you know you were going to be the maitre d' for a while, or did you still think in your mind, I'm just trying to come in, learn, and then maybe move up to, I don't even know what you do, cocktail, I, go back I in the cocktail bar? as the maitre d', but yeah. when I had my first couple of interviews there, there was no position available. And so I'd gone in for an interview at number nine, like, we think you're great, we think you have something special that fits with this company, but we don't know what that is. But we think we have a place for you over at a bar, drink. And we think that you could sit down with them and figure out a perfect place for you there. And maybe they could create a role for you. And that's when you sat down with John? And that's when you sat down with John. And they allowed me to create and own I love that. That's amazing. I the money to share. <laughs> um, being able to you know, use my education, use my professional experience, and be myself. And have a lot of authority to make guest facing decisions in the moment to fix problems is something that, that for that whole company really is really important to give mm-hmm. everybody the authority if you're a serving guest to talk a little more if you have to. You don't have to ask for permission. And having that power yeah. really makes you feel like a sense of autonomy. Yeah, but you don't want to take advantage of it. Right. You want to you respect be right it by people who've just given me this power to make those kind of decisions. And so it really felt like the perfect place to meet Bro and stand down my left edges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I did. And uh, it wasn't easy because I really come up to the very grim mm-hmm. mm-hmm. bunch of hardcore punk rock chefs and bouncers who were my coming up. Yeah, your world. Know? So, so you were, you're doing this at Drink, and then did you move straight from, from that role to somewhere else in Boston, or did you then think, you know, about starting your own thing? What was the path from there? I think that I knew that I wanted to open something up before I even got that job. Cool. I thought that that thing was going to be a nightclub. Hmm. And so over the course of roughly the four years that I was there, I started writing a business plan for a totally different. Hmm. It was a five million dollar ten thousand square foot nightclub, and I put together a team, a contractor, and mm-hmm. a project manager who oversaw the building of huge schools in Boston. She was one of my great connections, cool. and uh, a lawyer, and uh, you know, yeah, everybody, an accountant. Start building up your core yeah. people yeah. that are going to take care of you and hold your hand through a, a super stressful process yeah and you've never done it before and you need those people. oh yeah and a lot of people especially creatives think that they can just do it by themselves and that's just ridiculous yeah you, you can't no that's actually why we started this podcast is to sort of tell the story of of that it's, it's you know amazing. the creativity part and creating amazing products food experiences drinks whatever it might be is so c- crucial right because that's step one but then to really make it and to bring your good to the the public you need all these other people yeah. and a lot of creatives are I'd, I'd say most people try to do it themselves a lot I mean, of entrepreneurs just underestimate because they don't know what's involved they underestimate the process and think oh i've got this handled i think i can figure that out and they and it's so tough industry your whole mm-hmm. life but right. as an owner everything changes Completely. yeah and you mm-hmm. even though you do need to rely on your team you have to know how all of that stuff works so that you choose the right team mm-hmm. and that you understand what they're doing and oversee what your lawyer is doing and what your right. financial team or your um, broker or you can't always 
trust that everybody has your best intentions, your best. Um, How long did you try to get the uh, the club off the ground? Years. I, I worked on okay. that project. I want to say total for maybe like seven years from wow. concept to putting a deposit down on the space. Wow. I worked with like seventeen spaces for that night club and had a couple of investors lined up also to drink. Didn't end up working out with the investors. Which was heartbreaking. In what way? So one of my, my main investors was my connection to a lot of public money. We met a drink mm-hmm. and became really good friends. We came from very, very different worlds. And so his access to money was friends with private jets. Yeah. He wanted to have a really fun, cool, kind of crazy place to hang out. And so over the course of a year and a half, one guy really encouraged me and was so behind everything we did and so supportive and really forthcoming with his willingness to round up other investors about his circle. And it was a circle that, that private debt got. It was yeah. just not something outside of my clientele that I had a lot of exposure to. And so the downside of working with that much money um, is that Sometimes you have to kind of sell your soul a little bit. And so I found myself in a situation where this group of wealthy guys, like we don't want there to be much of an emphasis, as much of an emphasis on inviting the gay community into the club. Wow. So they were trying to make it like their own place, literally. Yeah. Wow. Got they it. They wanted a clubhouse and they wanted me to make it cool and make it be like a hot shot exclusive place, but that's not that's so what you're I going did. for. Yeah. Right. It wouldn't have worked. No. You know, I, I would have been miserable. And then you can tell when a business is run by somebody who just doesn't care or right. is over it or is burned out or is Yeah, you feel it right away. Yeah. In or is every aspect of it. Just like being controlled by the mm-hmm. investors. And so creatively you have to make some decisions. Like mm-hmm. how much creative control do I want? Should it is it worth Ending my relationship with this investor so I can stick to my value system. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, that's what happened. We yeah. had some disagreements about how he was living his life and the decisions that he was making and what impacts those personal decisions in his life were going to have on my business in the future. And in Massachusetts, I'm a doctor in California, to get a liquor license, you have to have such a flawless criminal record. Mm-hmm. You are. You can't have you know, nothing. You have to be spotless. And so some of these guys were just doing really shady stuff on the weekends. And like because they came from this sort of place of wealth and privilege, privilege, they didn't really see how that could affect me or my business. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. They would have been fine. Right. In the end, but maybe I wouldn't have gotten a liquor license. Right. And so I had it out with them. Strong guy one day. And we were on the way to my lawyer's office to sign an operating agreement. And he looked at me and he was like in sweatpants that day. Normally he's like, like well dressed, you know, yeah. this guy, the guy. And he's like, you know what, though? I just don't think I'm able to like, go in a restaurant. I was just like, Are you kidding? Well, you've been like, I've spent thousands of dollars already. Yeah. And, and have this whole team because you set up this expectation for me mm-hmm. that. This is what was in store for our business relationship. And that was devastating. Yeah, and, totally. And right then and there, and we already wrapped up like you know, 10 grand in legal bills alone, and we didn't even have space. Did yet. they help you out with that? No. Wow. No. So basically, all talk. All talk. Yeah. Um, at least after the first week, they made the deposit check for the. For the space? The space. We looked at 17 spaces. But they got that back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's no worse feeling when you're a creative <clears throat> depending on somebody else's money. Yeah. Of that plug getting pulled from under you unless you're willing to sell your soul. Totally. And so after I buried that project that I was so heartbroken over the experience and embarrassed, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I brought in probably Right. So much hype. People. You're telling all your friends. It's exciting. Yeah. And that's, that was a lesson learned for sure in that process. What'd too, you learn? Right? What was What would you and say next like? Next time around... Be a little bit more quiet about who I tell, who I tell my ideas to, 
Mm-hmm. And that's tough because you want to be able to share your ideas so that people support you. Yeah. yeah. But you don't want to get to the point where you have to find ways to save face because you're backing out of the project. Mm-hmm. Did you regret not trying to reach out to more investors? Or did this group really just cement it in, in terms of the interest? They were just like, yeah, this, we're it. This group made me feel like I wanted to do it more than I did the next round. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that brought me into Kickstarter when I started to make it. Yeah. And so... By the way, so your Kickstarter campaign, I tell everybody about. You did it the way everybody should do it. Like you should literally... You could, I think, start a company on just... Yeah, showing people how if you're passionate about something, all you all you're really doing is showcasing your passion for what you want to do. No, it's it's re it's honest, and I just thought it was the most amazing entire campaign that I've ever seen. It was very well done. I deal with tenants all the time, and sometimes I'm more convinced about their business than them. And when that happens, I point them in the direction of like, go to Becca's Facebook. Yeah. And scroll down on her timeline oh, and, <laughs> and you'll see yeah, an seriously. entrepreneur yeah. who actually is They're as passionate like she gave a shit. I, I remember. And there's no question. Yeah. There's, you can't question it, no. right? And the beauty of Kickstarter is that you're not giving away equity. Mm-hmm. And so when you, this is something that I looked at a little bit. So WeFunder, it's a little complicated because it forces the entrepreneur to know what equity means, one, two, how much of your company you're giving away. And then there's a little bit of legal documents that WeFunder helps you out with. And a lot of people make the mistake of giving away either too much equity to the investors or too little. Or the simple one is if I'm an investor, I say, if I give you $200, what is it going to be worth? And the entrepreneur doesn't know, like you don't really know. Or if I say, I'm going to give you $1,000, how much of your company am I getting? The entrepreneur, more often than not on WeFunder, doesn't know that answer. And so then it forces the entrepreneur to have to like develop that other skill, right? This new skill that you, you're just trying to raise money. Yeah. Gotta get a mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a mentor and somebody who's raised, you know, a million dollars before or more. And so for me, that person was Jeff Franklin, who was the president of the He's now with Colin Heller at Lynch. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. They hmm. open their own restaurant group. And, and wow. This time. But he, back when he was at Lynch before, was their main fundraiser. And he really knew how to sit down with an investor and have that financial conversation and be able to answer those kind of questions. Yeah. And we sat down and I like, convinced him to give me a lot of time and a lot of information. And even after having all of that information, like understanding different types of business structures and different types of return on investment and just the possibilities of what kind of financial relationship you can set up for an investor are totally endless. And mm. there's not really a set formula that mm-hmm. I've ever found that's going to work for every relationship every time. Yeah, Certainly that's true. Like it's not one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah, right? it's and neither so an art or a science. It's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You can ask for all of the, <laughs> the smartest investors in the world, mm-hmm. but if they've not been in your shoes at that mm-hmm. moment, trying to understand your brand and your passion and what you want to do with that money and, and what your motivations are, they may give you advice that would work great for them, but is mm. necessarily going to work great for you or, or the people. Uh, that you're going after. So, like, if you're just going after a standard venture capitalist home group that has a system and they have their own set of rules mm-hmm. and they're only looking for particular types of operators or creatives, if you don't fit in that mold, you're not going to get that answer. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're that, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. I mean, they know what they want. Yeah, and they mm-hmm. can really experience people when it comes to. Yeah. Money, yeah. Money, I sit down with some of our tenants and like one of them is a, a brewery, another one that we might end up developing here. And they send me all their financials and their, their deck. And so mind you, this uh, it doesn't exist yet, right? They're in the process of developing and hopefully getting a space. And so I'm looking at their deck and it, it says that their company's worth $15 million. And so I, I call and I say, hey, just so you know, there's no way you're worth $15 million. You're not mm-hmm. a tech company. 
you don't have anything, you just have beer. And retail is typically like, in terms of your valuation, one to three times your revenue. And so unless you're making $5 million a year at present, it's very difficult for you to make $15 million. And if you're a brewery making $5 million a year, you'd be the best brewery in the world. And that's just not mm-hmm. going to be you because you haven't started anything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so then I'm like, no disrespect, but whoever gave you the advice, to your point, mm-hmm. was clearly a tech investor. Yeah. Right. And so you're getting a tech valuation. And, and maybe there's an app to your whole business on a website or some like portal where beer gets delivered that I don't know about. <laughs> but if you're telling me you're going to build a brewery, there's no way you're worth $15 million. But if you do convince someone to give you money based on that valuation, you've now screwed over yourself and your investor. Mm. Because when you go to raise money again, you have to fix your valuation. But you've already accepted money at a $15 million dollar valuation. Because they thought they were getting it at a certain And way. so now you have a down round and no investor likes that. And so it's and they're like, I had no idea. And I'm like, right, because you're going to a lawyer who's likely never an accountant, whatever it might be. And this is not, not a knock on them. They've just never raised money or set up a business. Specifically, a brewery, let's say. Yeah, they set up plant a million businesses. Yeah, so right. Not, not this. in a tight little war right. or a And yeah. you, as the entrepreneur, are in such a vulnerable position at that point because, on one hand, you have investors telling you, I got you, I'm going to be your runway or whatever, you know, for this whole thing. Night and shine armor yeah, right and there. save yeah. you, and Absolutely. it's going to be so great. And then you, and you're like, on the one hand, okay, should I listen to them and go with them or. Because I don't, this doesn't feel right, but they're giving me money. Should I let them make decisions? And that's a huge thing. And then on the other hand, you have all these people giving you advice. And you don't, you know, you don't know which to take with a grain of salt and which to be, take as Bible. So it's, you and know. You also need to be like smart, successful. Right. Yeah. Right. People who want to support you. <laughs> yeah. But who you listen to when one person's saying, I know the ROI, the ROI for selling here is should be <laughs> should five percent. Or yeah. 20% and take the, the discrepancy between all of this macro advice mm-hmm. is so overwhelming and huge and terrifying that so to me when I started that concept, I thought about things a little bit differently and I really felt burned mm-hmm. from that first Your previous experience, yeah. 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 And it was really terrifying both to get back up on horse again after having these grandiose plans of opening up it. And spending money on it. Yeah, exactly. And so the cool thing about crowdfunding and not other, other than going and experience it doing t-shirts for whatever people, yeah. which is its own pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. um, right. It, it's, you don't own the brand. Mm-hmm. And so while I think I'll, for the next round of fundraising, I'm going to go back to where I started and yeah. not do crowdfunding, I'm really glad that I went through that experience because it allowed me to raise enough money for a prototype of the beginning of this very nimble concept, right? Mm-hmm. And so, to me, you guys can't really talk about what it is so much. Yeah. It's a very nimble thing. Yeah, it's, let's get into it's that. It's an idea right yeah. now. And well, it was a storefront. It was a storefront. What is yeah. Tanuki for people listening? Tanuki, your, your creation, how do you describe it to people? Depends on what day you're asking. <laughs> oh, okay. So, in the beginning, as you guys know, and mm-hmm. because you obviously saw the Kickstarter, it, the original idea was to have the first and only Cape Cod music. He's a Kaya, when you break up the word, it's spelled uh, Yah, the end of the word, is a shock, right? And um, if you break it down a little further, you can get sake out of the sake. Oh, yeah. And so basically, originally, the music Kaya is just a place that you go and drink sake. Yeah, um. so I love the idea of a place where people could come by, not necessarily just to get drunk at a bar, but to come and have a place to hang out and have a drink, not necessarily in the idea that it's like an older woman mm-hmm. drink, and a lot of other higher-end bars love to talk about how when guests come into the space, it's like coming into their house. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that's a nice idea. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, they have all of these tiny little spots. Some of them are even outdoors. Some of them are like a food truck with a canopy that sticks out the side and a few old sake bottles or plastic milk crates picked upside down and you get there and there's like in most cases a grill chef not necessarily sushi though you can have a sushi piece of pie hmm. but there's some sort of grill chef there who is serving beer and grilling that meat on sticks and hmm. smoking a cigarette at the same time and these little teeny tiny pockets of grill and osaka and cool. really all over right 
And That's awesome. It can be such a simple little key concept where literally all you have is that hemisphere and that hemisphere is being in subway and between spheres. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Just mm-hmm. What yeah. kind of things do you serve at Tanuki? So it depends on which, which day. generation of Tanuki you come to. What about the one in Provincetown that so I went to? I was so lucky. Thank you. It's amazing. Uh, it was a snack shop and a cafe. We, because that property came to me as a, a short seasonal sublet, I had the opportunity to just jump in and do whatever came to mind. I didn't have time to make a business plan for just that space. I've mm-hmm. already written mm-hmm. a pretty extensive business plan for this title, mm-hmm. but the space wasn't zoned as a seated restaurant, mm-hmm. and there was no liquor license associated with it. And I had these two guys who own the business next door say, I mean, you know, we, we think that we need to be a wedding space, and that's when we would just really, really briefly pop up and talk about their restaurant, the Christmas market. And they said, you know, we have this coffee and donut shop, it's not over it, it's not it's not doing the type of business that our other business is doing, and we still have six months left on the lease. You know, we just jump in, you know, use space as it is. Mm-hmm. You can decorate, you can paint it, whatever, but you know, there's an ice cream machine, a, a, a soft serve machine, and a 12 flavor gelato freezer, mm-hmm. and a uh, Lama Zocco espresso machine, you know, all this great equipment was just sort of sitting there. Mm-hmm. And I had no intention of having an ice cream shop. <laughs> right. I had no intention of even having a coffee shop or mm-hmm. a liquid coffee. But I had built this brand mm-hmm. and this character and this story. And I thought, fuck it. Let's just jump it. right in. Take some serious risks. Risk all of my money, my <laughs> marriage, my concept, my sleep, my health, everything. Did you sign a lease? Did you have to like sublease? Sub- it was a sublet, yeah. Okay. So we had... I'm married to a lawyer, so yeah. he did all of the uh, oh, good. Yeah. All the paperwork. Nice. That's good. And um, it kind of sucked, but there was a lot of... Did you raise the money before you signed the lease? Yeah. Okay. But I only did the grant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I had some of my own money. My mom died. She left me a little bit of cash. And um, and then I begged some friends and family to kind of help get me to that $50,000 amount. And beyond that, I mean, I really I didn't have enough money. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of knew it, but I had worked so hard at developing this brand, this concept. And it, it was one of those moments where, like, I didn't check on when I was hot, but it, it, it was always mm-hmm. Yeah. Know? And so. True. Time kills all deals. Yep. It it's mm-hmm. a fact. And it's at the same time, one of the lessons coming out on the other side is I don't want to rush back into this again. Mm-hmm. I want to do it right because I. I now have, I have a following, I mm-hmm. have a brand, mm-hmm. I have a feeling about what's associated with this story and this character, and, and I feel like as long as I sort of have these little teasers mm-hmm. over the course of time and keep myself relevant mm-hmm. somehow, which is one of the hardest things to do for any creative at this mm-hmm. time, I might feel like really so true. down a little bit. That's really true. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that I didn't wait when I had that money, mm-hmm. because Really when so did you good. how long was the the total campaign was it a month I think it was 60 days 60 days yeah. and how did you decide on 50,000 uh, it was more <clears throat> than any other like-minded business in the area I had raised but so maybe, setting the challenge high <laughs> yeah I, uh, I like it too much I like it so I think the average kind of research that I did on other kind of like-minded startup slash companies Shopify type businesses it was about thirty thousand dollars successful. So the successful crowdfunding campaigns that I saw were thirty grand. And you were like, "Nah, hold but my I beer, like, I can do this." Basically, <laughs> and thirty grand goes in quick. Those five minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be your security deposit right. in some right. cases. So day one, you launch, and then what do you do? You're just putting it because they give you some tips, right? They kind of tell you like, "Hey, go to your network, blah 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 blah." Yeah. And so you're you're doing all that. But you you also got PR, right? You got so I have PR background, so right? That I had on my side, and I already knew a lot of writers from all the nightclubs that I had been in, who I worked with, publicists, or whatever else. But then I had the added connections of having a bar machine associated with mm-hmm. mine, which continues to benefit my my data. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember like your first couple donations or did it, did it take a while? Uh, it, took, it was actually pretty quick. I think it was a couple of weeks after the campaign was done. But my dad, my stepdad was the first person that I read even before Kickstarter. Uh, I think I maybe started with five grand and then I probably put like $25,000 of my own money into it um, just to kind of get things started and buy equipment. Mm-hmm. And, um, yep. If you have to, in a big business, you have to have very stringent mm-hmm. connection of um, the health, the health yeah. department. Yes, like every, even the spoons, right? Have to be have a, a national, national ULI safety. rating and stuff. Yeah, yes, yeah, mm-hmm. so there's all these different safety ratings yeah. and NSF and UF. But all that stuff takes money. So if you think that you can make one pastry, mm-hmm. right? well, this is this is a good story. So I knew that I wanted to start making freezes. Mm-hmm. Because I knew that I was only going for fifty thousand in this first round, mm-hmm. and whatever you know, a couple of times that I had to make around that money was not going to go far, mm-hmm. right? And the idea was to phase out some of the started as a teeny tiny little pastry project. Mm-hmm. And what I wanted to do was have this great little pastry called Kawaki, which is a little waffle that's shaped like a fish, like a sea grain. And it has this great history in Japan and, and it started out with these homemade iron molds and now they have these big commercial machines that you can make like 12 or 24 or something wow. um, that you want in front of for a, a commercial operation. And so the first big piece of equipment I bought was a commercial tawaki machine. Cool. So that How much was that? Was space, it was like a thousand bucks. Okay. So I hired a friend to spend a couple hours, a friend from Bubble Inch, mm-hmm. uh, who had been the kitchen manager to spend a few hours doing research on how to find a machine that was quality and was in stand and that he can he was used to ordering specialty fish and fish mm-hmm. like I have no experience in it. Mm-hmm. Leaning on the experts. Try to. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work for you. <laughs> it will. Mm-hmm. He had never sourced a Taiwaki machine before mm-hmm. or like a large scale production so specific niche yeah. product that is not made anywhere in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we made the mistake of buying a machine from China that said it was NSF and all the safety rating stuff on it. And when it arrived in a big crate, you know, a few months later, after I bought the thousand bucks, I had to have equipment. The health inspector in that city is so notorious to all the environmental contractor friends and, and folks that work with over the years who have dealt with health inspectors in Greater Boston <laughs> as the most hard ass oh, man. Persnickety. I mean, if you have one piece of equipment, if you have one piece of equipment. Yeah. Um, wow. And so I said, Why? Uh, what do you say? The rating? Uh, well, so he wanted to know what the machine was made of. Which I actually think is a pretty That's a fair question. question. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially because it came from China. So I had a friend who was like an environmental testing scientist that I also happened to work at a surfboard shop with. Random. He was like this like kooky surfer who yeah. was also a scientist. Wow. Right? That's cool. Mm-hmm. And so I begged him to bring his little laser gun machine that was all over my house one day and test this machine. And this the local health inspector said, if you can get this machine to pass state standards, I'll allow it to to exist in your business without um, this NSF rating, right? And so to prove that it was safe, I had to make it in a red ink. Wow. Three percent red Three percent. Three percent. And was that on anything that was touching food or did it matter at all? Wow. Wow. So I still have this freaking machine. Yeah. And it's big. Yeah. I mean this thing takes up a lot of space. (laughs) And, and it's got lead in it. It has lead in it. And I definitely How long? Oh, my goodness. And they were delightful. It was a great machine. But also, <laughs> like, you buy stuff at your, you know, local, like a dollar store or something. Yeah. Or a, whatever you got, maybe put one back here. And it probably day. has some oh, sketchy, yeah. It has some, some sketchy Wow. Whoa. So, um, so that was my, one of my lessons. That's a good story. Crazy. Yeah, uh, as much research as you do, you're still going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're still, you could be in the business for 25 years. You think that you know everything. Mm-hmm. And 
if you haven't thought of tilapia machine in China before, how are you going to learn that lesson? Right. You know? And so I'm sure that there are a lot more. So you had to buy a new one? I think what we'll probably end up doing with the next round of funding, and I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to go after that yet, is to have one custom made in the United States. I looked into having them reverse fabricated, and that was like $10,000, which mm. seems like a lot. But because we now have this kind of beloved brand with this great little character that just gets people excited. What's the name of the character? Tanuki. The Tanuki. Is it? He looks so happy. So for people who can't, who are listening, it's a it's a raccoon. Sort of. It's like a bear raccoon with two balls. So he definitely. Well, okay, hold balls. on. Back up. Do you see those balls? <laughs> This, this isn't. I'm being descriptive. Yeah. You can quite literally. He's hung. Yes. He's a chubby, a chubby raccoon, super cute. What is he holding in his hand? Kind of my spirit animal. So, a fish. That's our little bit for this video. Yes, let's do that. I can't take any sort of credit. This is a cultural outcome. Tanuki, depending on what scholar you ask, and there is a fair amount of controversy about how the Pulse story comes in. But the one that, I'm, that I've settled on, that I believe, mm -hmm. is that it goes back about 900 years, all the way back to Chinese clocks before. Hmm. And so, hmm. originally, there was sort of this folklore character that lived in the woods who was mostly known as a kind of fox or a badger. But the chief shift in one thing. Mm. And so, if you were just to be in the woods 100 years ago, and you might spooked by something in the wind or something in the trees and it could be it could be a tanuki that transformed into the wind or transformed into a tree. You think about like a siren or a mermaid or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a bad mermaid. It's kind of the same thing as a You're trickster. You're a bad mermaid. Right? Yeah. The siren is out to get you mm -hmm. even though it has mm -hmm. this right. board of bringing in, right? And so the roots of the tanuki were kind of similar to that. Feeling. There was this Maudi character. Hmm. And then over the course of the last hundred years or so, he became more of like a pop culture icon in Japan. And okay. There was at least one version of him that was made popular by some Japanese celebrity or politician. His name was the Earth World War II, I think. Okay. And that's where he came into his current iteration of this fat, raccoon like. <laughs> Character with the big balls that represent like prosperity. Was that true? Yeah. Big balls represent prosperity. Wow, you're very it's prosperous then. Hey, hey, PG thirteen. And he also carries a promissory note. Like me. Oh. I think you're a tanuki. I'm a tanuki. What's wow. the fish? So he's also carrying a fish, right? Not traditional. Okay. I added the fish. I like that because I wanted to have uh, something that felt. A little bit cake potty yes. because our first brick and mortar was on the street, but also that the shape of our major pastry before my faculty <laughs> team didn't pass health inspection was a sea brain mark with kayaki shape. Oh, okay. And so I wanted to be carrying something that looked kind of like this, this pastry roll fish. But he also carries a jug of sake. And so what I tell Love myself with mm. the promissory note and the jug of sake is that he doesn't carry his investors, his investors back. At the end of all of this, so this is like go. me. See, it's my investors. Their you. worst case is they're and they, at breweries. And they deliver the, the and drinks and he puts them in the fridge <laughs> and then gives them out. So, yeah, the, yeah, worst case, you can. Wow. I think you're a tanuki. I'm a tanuki. I think that's your spirit animal. And so you had the brand before you started fundraising, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That was a big part of it. And then did you always have that's the smart. costume? No, the costume's cool too. So, with some of these. And the woman who made it is a costume designer actually from out from the West Coast. She makes Miley Cyrus' stage costumes. Cool. I think she's called like Mer Mary Henry costumes. Cool. But she does a lot of like mascot costumes for um, you know, schools or sports teams and stuff. So I, I submitted this order through a friend who is a costume designer and a friend of Mr. Ernest Hamilton. It's my friend, I don't know if you guys are cool with me, but she is a 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Make this costume at first, I was like, I'm gonna make it myself, but yeah, it's just super ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and you can't. No, that's a, such an entrepreneurial no. lesson, right? Right. That's always your first move. Let me do this myself, and then you're like, I'm not. Let a me se- not. I'm not a seamstress. I'm yes. not. I don't, maybe yeah. you are, but why it's am I hard. trying to learn how to do <laughs> <laughs> make clothes? That you know how to use any <laughs> oh, yeah. medium, but it's, that's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, some just yeah. do not come naturally, and they shouldn't because you're going to hire people who, for them, it does come naturally, yeah. you know, yeah. which is great. This lady who was like the top of her game, and this was not the first Snoopy costume she made. Wow. Really? Disney also worked on some of her. Wow. Are there Tanukis in Disney movies? No, I think this was for Epcot Center. Oh. Okay. So you're allowed. This <laughs> costume designer, something along the lines of the lovely Tanuki. Mm-hmm. But it's very important that he doesn't have any body parts that will change shape or size in the cold. In the cold. That's a hint. Oh. Did you, did you pick up on that? Oh. Because he's got two I balls. I was like, he's getting in Florida. <laughs> Becca, can you explain the joke? So the the, the tanuki has two big balls. I get it, but why didn't they just say that? I, I feel like they had to be It's Disney. The Come on, it's PG. It's Disney. It's gotta be. I mean, yeah, but see, I get, I get memo. It's not a public work like purchase order. No, no, no. Hold on a second. In this day and age, if something gets written down, true, it's public. True. At the end of fundraising, let's talk about that for a second. So you you ended your Kickstarter. How far are you away from the goal on within like with forty eight hours left? Oh gosh, probably like two grand away. We're like close, but so close, but so. Yeah. And you're doing yeah. Facebook posts almost hourly, it seemed, at Even some point. more frequently, I think. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I, I'm not, like I said before, I'm not a tech person. I have no joy in spending time on social media, mm-hmm. um, posting from like the hashtags. That's just not how I want to spend my time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was this desperate 60 days of trying to change my mindset about how I was going to use my creativity. And what those six days that creativity was spent thinking about money, which is not natural for Mm-mm. me. I'm not motivated by For money. most creatives, I think. Yeah, and I just had this endless stream of ideas, and it was bad for my point where I actually put in work in turning the idea into something that can make money. Like, it's just an idea. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and even if you're just a an artist and you're making, like, a painting or a sculpture mm-hmm. or whatever, there's not necessarily a chance that going to sell. Right. Not that you're making any money. Yeah, it's a hobby otherwise. Exactly. And um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you needed one of them to make money. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not good at having a boss. Mm-hmm. I don't have a boss that I can call the fuck yep. The relationship's Me either. not work. I'm not when trying did, to ask for vacation time. When did you learn, did you learn oh, that? Real young. Yeah. Okay. But um real young. But I, I knew that I had an entrepreneurial spirit coming from like lemonade stand age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even in college, most places would give you like a freshman maybe that you can choose from. Mm-hmm. And then I'd create my own. <laughs> yeah. And so that turned a four-year college experience into a nine-year college experience. Mm-hmm. Of just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I wanted to focus on how I wanted to further refine who I was as a professional and who mm-hmm. I was as, um, as a creative and as someone who didn't want to have a boss. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have a real problem with authority. <laughs> and so if I'm forced in a situation where I have to yes somebody to that. It's just not going to happen. That's soul sucking to me. It's soul sucking. And I can do that with my guests mm-hmm. because I do genuinely like to make people happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I like to do it my way. It's right. your, your terms, yeah. And if it feels like work, you're checking out. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. When you opened, what was that like? So you first opened and then. <laughs> The reception of this business in that space was so interesting in that community. I definitely felt really supported by a lot of local artists and people who work in the service industry. The curious part about being in a very touristy, very high foot traffic area when you have such a niche, quirky brand was that, at least in my case, people were coming out with their tiny tattoo shirt, expecting lobster rolls and vanilla ice cream cones, mm. and they would get a Tanuki ball stack and 
<laughs> super obscure Japanese ingredients in mm-hmm. my rice balls. Because uh, the thing that bugs me the most mm-hmm. in every iteration of TV is that when you eat Java rice balls, you eat a really horrible starch pack of rice. It's actually grown here in California. Wow. Uh, it's called um, Masu, is the brand name. And mm-hmm. they put your rice as part of the Kelly. And it's one of the best rices that you can buy. And so when you blind taste either of these things next to a fine part, even a high-end fine part, so like if you go to the grocery store or Whole Foods or whatever, you get sushi rice, chances are you're going to find the Nishiki brand, which is a relatively higher-end quality of rice. But when you taste Nishiki next to Matsu, it's like eating plastic. Oh, wow. It's like this most floral, interesting, it's wow. a sensational smell. That you don't get from this other type of rice. Oh. And they're both the same purpose. They're both meant to, just to make a nice sushi roll, or in my case, in you. And so, over the course of time, I haven't had that many complaints about the price that I charge for things. But recently, a food blogger who's not in the restaurant world reached out to me after having one of my pop ups, and he was like, you can pay $25 for a box of snacks. It really feels like a lot of money. And so at first I had this like terrible sinking feeling, oh my god, my, my customers feel like they're cheated and I've I've created a negative experience for somebody. But I explained all this to him about the blind taste testing and doing research on buying the best ingredients and at the end he was like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not a restaurant person, I don't understand the math behind uh, buying in quantity either. Mm-hmm. So like mm. even if you are using the best quality items, obviously the more you can buy Mm-hmm. In a larger, a larger operation, the more money that you're going to save. Right. But when you're a teeny tiny operation starting off at 50 grand, you're not buying huge quantities. Million, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You're, you're buying, you know, 50 pound bags, mm-hmm. not truckloads. Right. right. You don't have a warehouse full of stuff. Yeah. And so surprisingly, I haven't really received much pushback on mm-hmm. price, and I've tried to be as fair as possible. I try really hard with mm-hmm. people coming in the shop with me and my pop ups. What am I doing? To make them feel, especially mm-hmm. to make them feel welcome. I think it's an alive brand. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but but also like what's too much? Mm-hmm. What's what's gonna suck my soul away mm-hmm. after a certain amount of time, or just make me so nice of a of a business owner that I'm not making any money, and then it's just like coffee where I just give myself out, and right? All of my products and all of my energy away for nothing in return. Mm-hmm. And so, like you said before, I mean, that turns into a really expensive hobby, mm-hmm. right? And so, yeah. when you bring into this picture how investors feel about those kind of relationships, the type of investors that I'm looking for in the next round are people who are going to get that in order to make people feel not necessarily special, but at the very least satisfied when you're building a brand and launching a niche luxury product, you kind of have to bend over backwards mm-hmm. to stand out and to continue to have love for this thing that you created, right? right? If you're just setting a, a set of standards that your entire staff has to follow and you don't have the autonomy or the authority to switch things up on the fly, every single guest is going to get the same monotone, robotic, experience that a lot of people who are looking for something special just aren't going to want to yep. let's, let's talk about what's next for you. So what are you what are you working on now? How much money are you looking to raise in the future? Is it a are you going to be in Provincetown? Let's talk That's about nice. what's next. So after my Provincetown experience and I Did it go well? Like, you made money, it was profitable, it was we exciting. Were busy, but it wasn't profitable because our rent $10,000 a month and Which we, is we've months. been pushing lobster rolls and frozen rose and it's just, you're just not the market right you have a different right. market yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. not the business model we're not a high volume model mm-hmm. and in order for Tamiki to work as a really special place where you get a different kind of treatment and every time you come in is a new experience I hate to use the word creative because that word is very, you know, it doesn't really have a meaning anymore, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like not it means whatever you want it to mean. Yeah, exactly. The true meaning of that word, that if, if you were to come and have 
the quote unquote creative experience. Every time you walk through the door, me or my team are looking at you and trying to size you up and trying to figure out what is the experience that you're coming here today? Mm -hmm. How do you want to be greeted today? Mm -hmm. And then as we get to know people, you know, certain regulars may have certain quirks or things that we know they expect when coming through their space. But no person comes into the same space over and over again. All these different ways to meet them. It's very intuitive you to like yeah. identify that. Yeah, very. So, what they, yeah. are you? Will you be in Provincetown or will you go somewhere else? So, so to kind of bring it full circle, I don't think I'm going to be in Provincetown anymore because yeah. I don't think that financially. Uh, it sounds really expensive. I mean, yeah. that's, it's outrageous. And yeah. it's and it's seasonal too. So it's like that's the other thing. Yeah, is that if you don't make. All your money <laughs> in two months <laughs> in of the year. In three months, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah and essentially, it's I mean, you have it's like two and change. Season, but if you're spending ten grand a month and you can't even get thirty seats in your space, you have no money. I've never faced public with pro. We didn't even have hot water. I had what? To do dishes with my espresso machine. What? We wow. barely passed our health ten inspection. grand a month, no seats, and no hot water. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're supposed to have hot water, but. Uh, <laughs> The landlord is just such a greedy asshole. Yeah. And that I'll say some, No, sometimes. I, mean, if I was a jerk. Most sometimes of them are. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you deal with that. I mean, more often than not, I think tenants deal with that. Like, that's the situation. That's the landscape. Surprisingly, I came in, I met him for the first time. Came into the shop about a month after I was open. On a busy Friday afternoon, I had a wine at the, uh, the espresso bar. And um, I think I might have been short staff, so I was making espresso with a couple of these stuff. And this guy comes in to cuts to the front of the line. He's like, well, is this the manager here? And I'm just like, oh, God, here we go. Mm. Oh, I'm the manager. I didn't expect to have to have you. Oh, but is the owner here? Oh, my God. Are you kidding me. I was like, still me. Still me. Yep. <laughs> How can I help you? And he's like, oh, I'm the landlord. And he, he takes me away from my business. Yeah, totally. This particular afternoon, he sort of chastised me for not having a, um, a bar code out front. And in Provincetown, when you walk down up and down Commercial Street, a lot of the more established touristy restaurants will have somebody standing out front with the menu, mm -hmm. you know, barking at people on the street to try to get them to come inside. I didn't know that that was the term for them, and yeah. I'm so happy it is because it's annoying. A barker. So it's annoying. so annoying. And wow, I didn't know that was a thing either. I crossed the street. It's not the experience I'm looking no. for. And why would he expect that from you? Or, or right. demand it? That's that's like part of the culture down there for these tourist restaurants, and that's how they make money is to station somebody out there to kind of aggressively go after business. And as a, as a someone wanting to have a destination location, I was just in the wrong place, and it wasn't the right space. And so, had I had more time to think about it before I delved into that space, mm -hmm. I probably would have decided against it in the long run, but because it was a sublet and I knew that there was an out, that yeah. night, so what's the worst thing going to happen? Right. Flush $50,000 down the toilet, but come away with a prototype and an experience of, of like so much experience. The future, how are we not going to run this in the future? Mm -hmm. What works in this space? What doesn't work in this space? What, as just a person, not a business owner, but like a person has to be here every day. Right. How does this feel? Mm -hmm. Do I like what I'm doing? Do I like this location? Do I like the people that are coming to my shop? Are they making me feel fulfilled? And at the end of the day, I loved the community and I loved being able to have this sort of subversive yet also luxury brand exist in a community that is totally secular. Yet, when push comes to shove, they can't afford to be there and you're a business. There's no business room. Mm -hmm. And so... Where will you go? Where do you want to go? So so we bought a condo in uh, Union Square in Senator. And um, now I'm back in the city. I'm tied down to the city. Mind you, I was clueless when I was in Provincetown. The first few months, we lived in a tent. What? Where? Last, Where was this tent? In, in Provincetown. Renting the tent space for me and two other men. Like camping? Shop. Camping. Okay. We camped. And this is not glamping. No. This was like straight up camping. Like we did not have electricity or water at our tent site. Because every time we went to bed. And so wow. not only was that challenging for me, but it was extremely challenging for the people who came to work for me or really, at least in the beginning, 
to live through that. And all of us are going, but Leslie said, not everybody is as tough as what it is right now. No. Facts. And also, mm-hmm. not everybody is. You're back of the record. You gotta, back, you gotta bet on yourself there. You've yeah. gotta be really, mm-hmm. really tough and have a really thick skin mm-hmm. to be in the business, even if you have millions to start. Mm-hmm. But then to be passionate enough about your business where you're willing to live in a tent with no power mm-hmm. in a community that has no housing for a staff. It's a massive it's a crisis down there. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. And I was yeah. not the only business owner living with me. At the end of the summer, when some of my staff left, because they got burnt out, or they didn't I think we've got like the headline of like, you know, the, the intro here. <laughs> wow. I moved back into my shop, which I totally wasn't supposed to do. Uh, and I was left with the following. In the papers, office? Um, on a beach here in between two ice cream freezers. The office was a little too exposed <laughs> to the outside, and I wanted it to be like really under the radar and private and. You know, I was kind of breaking the rules a little bit. Yeah. And so I had a huge chair with a feather bed on top of it and, like, some fancy thousand thread count sheets to make myself kind of feel like... Like it wasn't a beach chair in between like two it, freezers. Yeah, but wow. it was. And looking back on it, I mean, I, I wouldn't have created that experience just so that I could have, like, a cushy pad in the city. Mm-hmm. But now that I have a cushy pad in the city, I'm thinking, all right, so I have a long-term plan, but mm-hmm. not really have a health plan. That's cool. But uh, I have a short-term goal of, you know, within the next year or two to start looking for tea garden space in the San Joaquin River area. Amazing. And so it's essentially the same, a similar business model to what we first raised the money for. Uh, it could be an easy buyout. But I don't just want it to be a car. One of the things that I learned about being a province town, that I think I already knew about myself as somebody who grew up on the Cape, was that I need to have some sort of access to the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, especially businesses in the Boston area, how many many months of the year are you stuck inside? Oh my God, that's that's why I love living here. Three three or four maybe, yeah. Yeah, They're just trapped. trapped. Trapped Mm -hmm. in colder is an awful word with myself, but seasonal depression Mm -hmm. from being in the dark and inside and not having fresh air. So I want to have a space that throughout the year, even in the winter, has enough windows, enough light, enough outdoor space where we can, maybe even if it's like a, maybe even it has a, um, or a comfortable roof. Yeah. Right. And you can have heaters. Oh, that's cool. LA yeah. That mm-hmm. has some kind of similar. Yeah. Oh, are you open to LA? I'm open to anything. I mean, I, 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 I've worked so hard on developing this brand. Yeah. I definitely don't want it to be a chain, but the thing that I've experienced through starting up as a uh, kiosk on the beach in the middle of December and Cape Cod and mm-hmm. it was like below zero and we were trying to hawk Japanese pastries to people in the fall or Christmas time to having a super expensive high-end shop in the middle of <laughs> province town on the high season to what I've been lately is popping up at friends' restaurants and bars. Um, so I've been saying before, how do you stay relevant mm-hmm. in between all these projects, right? And people are so easily distracted by every other new hot chef restaurant or, or chef or clothing company or I mean, just constant distraction, right? And so by mixing up the locations and the menu and the service style, but keeping the essence of the culture of community. Um, You're like a shapeshifter. Uh, yeah. And Doing all that. That's exactly. Full circle. Yep. That's exactly wow. uh, what, what to make you. Well done. <laughs> Where can people find you? How can they help you? Well, first things first. I <laughs> got to follow us on the old Instagram. Yes. Is it it's, at? It's, uh, it's at. I'm going to have to spell it. It's Go ahead. Tyler, it's T-A-N-U-A-R-T-A-R-Y-A. Tyler Atkins. It's T A N U A R T A R Y A A R. Because you can only like to me, Tyler, if you know how to spell it. So the mm-hmm. next few steps are to raise another fu- uh, round of funding. Mm-hmm. And, and to answer your question about how much, it really depends on the location. I think creatively, right. and I don't know if you guys experience this as developers from the creative side, but I have a really hard time, even with the same consistent brand and like the same basic menu elements and the same sort of spirit of how I want people to be treated. Every time I go to a new location, whether I'm popping up at an economic shop or, you know, in the future, maybe building out a couple million dollar cafe or things like that, it's got to look exact 
that space. For sure. And that location, in that neighborhood. That's and smart that of you to scene. recognize that. And so I'm really anti turn this into a chain mm-hmm. because you can never, even if you go to McDonald's in like Midtown Manhattan versus up here in LA, right? Even McDonald's makes it a point to bring in some element of local mm-hmm. color or culture or art or something. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, a big corporate chain like that is less because we feel like it's the right thing to do and it's natural and it makes the brand feel organic and more that it's just like kind of a business expectation at this point. If you want to chain, people you have to. really yeah. easily, right? And you become irrelevant. Become sterile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't ever yeah. want somebody to walk into one of my spaces. You know, let's say you know, five years down the road, we've got a, a shop here in, in LA and a shop in Boston. I don't ever want somebody to walk in and be like, oh, it's just like the place in Boston. No. Because that's it's, not where you are. No. And even, that's smart. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Is, if you have like a big, beautiful, light filled space, um, you know, in a high rise, it's like you're in a penthouse, right? That's a totally different feeling mm-hmm. and experience than, um, you know, a little beach shack. Right. Provincetown mm-hmm. or someplace down the street from that that might be it's of the place. Different architecture, mm-hmm. different lighting, different smells, different right. feeling, different neighbors. Mm-hmm. And so over the course of the next year or so, I definitely will spend some time with my husband, my business partner, looking for property, thinking about how we want to fundraise for that particular space. But um, I have so many endless ideas of how I want to spend this brand, and that's just. The next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like a really easy leap to get to the next step because I, I did the last <laughs> step and it was so hard then. But yeah. looking back, I'm like, oh, I got that. You did it, yeah. yeah. You learned to sell my. I mean, the story is so, so good. I mean, you you yeah. you try to develop something that didn't work. And then you develop something, and you learned a lot while doing it in Provincetown. And it worked aside from the location, yeah, right? The elements and the work. of it yeah. worked. And for me, the most important elements of it still work. I mean, we do pop-ups. We're now getting regulars to the pop-ups, and that feels so good. That's it's always awesome. louder, and it's exciting. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you so does. much. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Seriously. Of course. Yeah. 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 Just ship it is the point, right? Just try. <laughs> take, take the losses. You'll come Learn. back. You'll do more. Commit to your campaigns, especially mm-hmm. on Kickstarter. Or whatever you decide to do, and you'll get there. Yeah, you'll you'll so you'll get there. And if you're not trying to make money, it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Find the balance between the two. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We here at Startup the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Make sure to give us a rating on iTunes. Anything over five stars is the only way to go. Our music is composed by Double Touch. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. For more information on the products and businesses featured on the show, check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.